Hey, good morning. Hey, if you're new, I'd also like to welcome you. I'm Charlie, the lead pastor here, and um, like Mark said, we are finishing up our series, um, kind of looking at this first section of the book of Acts all the way up until kind of uh, the con- conversion of Saul, which we're looking at today. And um, a story I want to tell you uh, as we kind of are wrapping this up, it's kind of this defining moment of sorts in my life, uh, it was the summer of 2001, June 2001 to be exact. And um, we'd spent, we got married in 1994, we spent the first six years as a family working with a, a college ministry, and um, it really felt that God was calling us into to church ministry, and uh, so we moved to uh, Denver, Colorado from Conway, Arkansas to go to seminary. If you don't know what seminary is, it's just preacher grad school is what it is. And so to become a pastor, uh, we were going to go and finish the seminary degree out there. And so I was going to school during the day and getting a job, just trying to do what we can to kind of hang in there as we are a family of four, uh, three-year-old, newborn, and full-time dad, student, and also just trying to work to kind of keep things going. So the job I had for most of the time I was there is I was a night manager at one of the Chick-fil-A's in the Denver area. And apparently, I'm you know, trying to brag or anything, apparently whatever my natural skill set is, is very conducive to being the night manager at a Chick-fil-A. Because the, um, the, the, the owner-operator there was very complimentary. He's like, man, I don't know what it is you're doing. Man, we really love having you here. These, you know, the numbers that you're producing at night are the best that we have ever had. You're so great. I mean, he was just very complimentary and it just blessed me. A lot, and then so after a few months, been there. I guess by this time, seven or eight months. It was June, June two thousand one. Uh, he comes up to me. He's like, "I mean, I know you're you're at seminary to become a pastor, but have you considered um, running your own Chick Fil A?" And I'm like, "No, I ha- I hadn't." And he's like, "Man, you really should." And so I had all these reasons why I should. I was like, "Man, I, I'm a, I'm here to do ministry." He's like, "Man, you're doing ministry right now. I see the way that you interact with these kids that you're there and." With, with our staff, I, I see the way that you do it. You're ministering to them now. And then he begins to list out all the ways that he uses this as a platform for ministry. He's like, and you'd be really good at it. You should totally do this. And so then he explains to me kind of what's involved. He says, in order to be able to do it, you, ha- it's, you don't really own anything. It's just, it's, you know, it, they still own it. You're just an operator. So you don't have to have this huge amount of money. You only need $5,000. It's changed since then, but at this time, 2001, you only need $5,000. And then he said this, and I will give you the $5,000. All right, all right. And he said, listen, you, you know, this was kind of known. He's like, you know this, that I'm kind of, he was the first operator that they ever let have two stores at once. He had a mall one and a freestanding one. He's, he kind of invented this idea of what they called at that time outside sales. He's, they sold hundreds of sandwiches and nuggets and things to the schools out there. I mean, he pioneered that. He's like, listen, I'm kind of this influencer. If I attach to your application a letter that says, I like this guy, you will get in. So you should totally do this. A couple of days later was the end of the month where you have to print out all the papers and sales and everything for the month. And I don't know if this was by his design or not, but I printed out those things at the end of that night. I'm decent at math and I can read a piece of paper. And so I, he told me about the, um, how the profit sharing works. And so I'm sitting there with this and I did all the math. And the number that I came up with, and June was a, a, lo- a slow month because there weren't all these sales that they were doing to schools. He, he cleared more money that month than I had ever made in a year. Certainly more than I was making that year. And um, you do the math times 12, but really it wouldn't be more times 12. It would probably be more like times 20 or 25. But we're talking about levels of money that, that I'm likely not ever going to see, which is fine. Which is, it's fine. <laughs> and um, I think he knew because he comes up to me like a couple of days after that and he's like, hey man, thanks for printing out those numbers for you. Have you thought any more about what I was talking to you about? which of course I had. Obviously, this was a very significant moment for me. Uh, we were living, again, we were a family of four, the three-year-old and the newborn, living in about 400 square feet apartment, and um, eating beans and free Chick-fil-A meals was essentially the diet that I had. And, 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 and he, had, he had made a very convincing case. Uh, but I did something that I think was important. 
I, I prayed about it. I was like, God, this is an incredible opportunity. Um, but what do you want? And as clear as anything, he says to me, I've got you on the path that I want you on. Keep going this way. And 18 years later, um, I don't regret it. I'm not, I'm not sitting here with any remorse. I'm not telling you this story about that today is not a story about missed opportunities. Um, but it is a story about a kind of a life-defining moment for me. About there is kind of this, this, this fork in the road of my life, not just career-wise, what was I going to do, but also who am I going to be, and even at another level, who gets to decide who I am going to be. And so what we're going to be looking at today, and I think this is a great moment, a great way for us to kind of close out this series, is, is to ask ourselves, you know, kind of think about these moments that we have. And we're going to look at this story, and in the story we're going to look at two different people that between the two of them have what I will call three very significant moments. And the kind of moments that I believe that God at some point in our life is going to ask each one of us to have. And the decision that we may will greatly affect who we are, our relationship with God, and really the course of our life. And as we wrap this up, I just kind of want us to kind of have this, kind of our last we will statement, that what we're talking about today is this, is that we will, we will say yes to God moments. You're going to have a lot of God moments in your life. You're going to have a lot of moments where you have these defining moments and, 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 and God puts them there. And we want to make a commitment individually and collectively as a church that when we have these moments, that we will say yes to what it is that God is calling us to. So we have in Acts chapter 9, we're, we're hearing again about this guy named Saul. We've seen him a couple of times. He was there at the stoning of Stephen, the first martyr post-Jesus, the first person follower of Jesus to be killed um, after Jesus' death and resurrection. He was there and was approving of it. And then is described as being this guy who was going all over Jerusalem, persecuting and arresting people that called themselves followers of Jesus. And here in Acts chapter 9, what he's trying to do here is he's trying to get it to the next level, to move the persecution and arrest and torture and sometimes murder of Christians to move beyond just what's going on in Jerusalem. Verse 1, Acts chapter 9. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, which is at this point the description of what it meant to be a Christian, who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him, he fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. He replied, Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. So this is referred to as kind of the conversion of Saul. He starts off as this um, rabid anti-Christian persecutor and has this moment where um, he, he comes to faith in Jesus Christ. And for some of you who are familiar with this story, you'll know this, but some of you may not be particularly familiar with this story, but I've heard a Christian or someone say as they have these kind of defining moments like, I didn't see a bright light or anything, but... I didn't hear a voice in the sky or anything, but... Like, where does that come from? This is where a lot of that comes from. This idea that, that in these big moments, God shines a big bright light and there's a big booming voice from heaven. And that's what happens to, to Saul here. He has this moment where Jesus himself, through a bright light, speaks with a booming voice and says, you have to stop this. He's like, who are you? He's like, I'm Jesus, the one that you are persecuting. You must stop this. And in this moment he realizes that this thing that he was doing, zealously he thought for God, was actually against God. He was, he was punishing God. He was trying to persecute God. And he's like, you have to stop this. 
And again, what this passage is called, the story really is, it's his conversion. And so the first moment that we all have is our conversion moment. The moment in which we have to make a decision, am I going to truly be a follower of Jesus Christ or not? Now the great thing, this is a really cool story with the, with the light and the voice and all of that. But one of the challenges that I think that has with this story is I've heard people say this, that they then compare, like I just said, well, it wasn't a big bright light, I didn't hear a voice from heaven. We kind of talk like this that somehow Paul's conversion story is the standard and by comparison mine is just kind of weak and awkward and lame. And, and we have to get over that because any time any person recognizes that their sin has destroyed them emotionally, spiritually, has eternally separated them from God, and that they are helpless without it. Anytime someone has that moment, it is an incredible moment when you say yes to that. God, I need your help. I need Jesus' death on the cross to pay for my sins so that I can be given a relationship with you. Anytime that happens, that it is an amazing thing. And we do not need to be in a play. Again, I've heard way too many people say this over the years. Like, well, you know, you know I mean, I mean, I, I, it was, I wasn't as, I didn't really do anything really bad, and I just kind of heard about Jesus, and I thought like I should, and there wasn't any big thing, and I just, I just started following him. That's a great story if you'll just tell it a little better. Right? It, it's a great story. You recognize what your sin had done to you and your need for Jesus and you decided to follow Him. Because that same sort of attitude, I think, sometimes keeps us from saying yes to Jesus in the first place. Because we are not a murderer, because we're not a persecutor, because we haven't been really bad, because there are people that I know that are worse than me, because I seem to be better than a lot of people, because I have all these reasons, I don't really need Jesus. Not like this. Not like Paul needed something. I just need some encouragement every now and then to be a little bit better. I need advice. I need a spiritual counselor. No, we need Jesus who died for us. And, and we need absolute forgiveness because the sin that we have committed has undone ourselves and has destroyed our relationship with God. And we're in desperate need. So if you have never had that moment, regardless of your perception of your past, you are in desperate need of Jesus and encourage you to say yes to that moment. But then we're going to be here to be introduced to another guy, a guy named Ananias. A guy named Ananias who is a follower of Jesus who is there in Damascus as well, which is now where Paul is. He hasn't eaten for a few days. He's still blind and he's still trying to, I'm sure, trying to put his mind around what exactly has happened to me. And God, rather than deciding to visit Paul again, talks to this guy, Ananias. Verse 10, Acts chapter 9. In Damascus there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go! This man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to suffer and, and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. <coughs> then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now to me, Ananias is kind of one of these underrated characters um, that kind of doesn't quite get as much positive publicity as, as, as a guy like this should. So, because what happens here is this murderer, whose only job, it seems, is to persecute and arrest Christians, comes to Damascus. 
And, and it's funny, I, I don't know if this is intentional, the writing, intentional what, 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 the, what God actually said to Ananias, kind of whatever. Like, but what God says, like, there's this guy named Saul. He's from Tarsus. He's in this house. You should go talk to him. He knows you're coming. And then I was like, mm-hmm. Yeah, like something, this ain't some random guy named Saul who happens to come from. I've heard of this guy, and uh, he kills people like me. He's come here with the, uh, with the intention to arrest people like me. I'm not going to do that. And that is a perfectly reasonable response. I'm not going to go to the Christian murderer. I'm, I'm a Christian. That's why he's here. I'm not going. And, and, and God has a really eloquent response back to Ananias. Go. That's it. That, man, that's what he, that, that is his response. That is his response to Ananias. He is, he is oh, it's going to be fine. You'll be good. It's, it's safe. It's, no, I, I said go, and then you gave an objection. And then my response to that is actually go. Because there's a moment for Ananias. And again, I don't want to understate it. I want to bring it out. I mean, this is, this is, a, this is a very significant Scary thing that he was asked to do. But he has a moment too. We saw Saul's conversion moment. And now Ananias has what we're going to call a lordship moment. This is a lordship moment where he has to make a decision. Who gets to decide what I do? Who gets to decide who I am? What my life is about? God says, do this. I have an objection, and God goes, well, okay, I see it. I'll, I'll try to ask somebody else, I guess. God says it. You have an objection. He's like, no, you forget I said it. Go. Because I think that some of us have this mentality sometimes, it just kind of creeps in, that somehow what a Christian life is supposed to be about is about comfort and safety. That God is here to make me comfortable and to keep me safe. Which helps us to, we need to ask the question, is God here for me, or am I here for God? Is, um, is God the creator of the universe, and the Lord of everything, or is he a genie in a bottle? And by genie in a bottle, it's like I recognize that the genie in the bottle has all the power, has this unlimited amount of power, it would seem. And then there's some trick, right? And then this great, powerful being comes out, and I was like, I want more money. Poof. I want to be better looking. Poof, right? I mean, and, and, that, and, that, and that's the dynamic of the relationship. I now have this all-powerful genie who works for me, who is designed to give me the life that I want. Now, here's the thing. I know you all well enough to know that none of you would actually say that. Who's in charge, you or God? Oh, I think I, think I know this one. God. Is God your genie in a bottle? Mm, no. But is he, though? Is God the Lord? Does Jesus Christ have the authority to tell you what to do and you recognize that if he says it, I must say yes? I've already told you, I kind of led off with a story of kind of a lordship moment for me where God had me on this particular path and um, I asked him, he's like, this, this path seems good. He's like, no, this path. And I don't want you to hear that the point of that story is is that clearly I made the right decision because I made the one that would give me less money or somehow I chose the more spiritual one that preacher is better than business owner. That is not the point of that story. The point of that story is um, I asked God and God told me because I could imagine a very similar situation where some kid straight out of college decides to go to seminary and he does this because he thinks that's what Christians are supposed to do and he's trying to impress his parents or he's trying to impress some pastor or maybe he's even trying to earn his way with bonus points. Like, if I do this super spiritual thing, then God's going to be extra good to me. And he didn't really ask God if he was supposed to become a pastor. He just did it because he thought that's what you're supposed to do. 
And then this opportunity comes up, and God's like, I never wanted this for you. You thought this is what I wanted from you, but actually, you can do greater things for me by doing this. It's not about which one of these things is better. It is about who gets to decide. So as far as who you are and what you do and the way that you're living your life, who gets to decide? And so, but there's also more to it. I mean, career track is thing, kind of what my life is supposed to look like, what I'm supposed to live, who I'm supposed to, those kinds of things. But then there's also these lordship moments that really have to do a lot with sin. Because I think that there are some of us who have decided that there are some sins in our life that are just okay. God's okay with these. They're not that big of a deal. You know, there's, there's bad sins and then there's, Sins that God's like, my old buddy. Or there's some sins, and you hear this, like, well, this, I, I, I can't help it. And so you surrender. You don't surrender to sin. You surrender to Jesus. And he gives you victory over the sin without the excuses. And the way that the direction that I have in the life and the character that I have as I'm living this life is determined by what God says to be true. Not what I want to be true or what I feel to be true, but about what God says is true. And so, we have to have this moment where I am willing to recognize that what determines the course and the future of my life is what God says is true for me. I am here for God more than God is here for me. Because again, i just say this one more time. I think we just get confused because God is so overwhelmingly gracious, because the salvation that He offers us is completely and totally free, because of this huge sacrifice that Jesus made for us and that everything is free that He gives us that we just get a little confused. And we think that then the purpose is for God to just do good things for me. And we define good as safety and comfort and happy. Following Jesus, saying yes to your lordship moment, I promise you is for your good. We just may have to redefine what good means. And it starts with us saying... You're in control, not me. As we finish up this passage, we've got Ananias. He's there with Saul telling him, Saul said, hey, you know, he sent me here so that you could see again and be filled with the Spirit. <coughs> Verse 18. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. At once, he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. <clears throat> so what we have here is that, he says it felt like scale, something just completely dropped. He could see again. He got up, he was baptized, he gained his strength from some food, spent some time there with, with, with the guys in Damascus, and it says at once, immediately, Immediately he recognized that what God was calling him to was to take what God had given him and to give it to somebody else. And so, uh, again, this is, uh, I, I love Saul, and he, this, this is a very powerful story, but sometimes his story is a little bit intimidating because this third moment that we're going to look at, it seems for him was simultaneous. And for lots of us, it's not. And if, if it's not simultaneous for us and we look at for him it's simultaneous, it's like, well, I'm already behind, I quit, or whatever. Because the moment that he has here, what we're going to call it, in addition to a lordship moment, a conversion moment, is he has a mission moment where he recognizes immediately that his life is meant to be about taking what God has given in, to him and to give it away. That he, he is now on mission. My life is about being on mission for God. He got it. According to this, verse 20, he got it at once. He is converted and seemed to immediately understand this is who I'm supposed to be. In part, that's because God had a unique plan for Saul. But it's in part a little bit, that's just kind of how this dude is. 
None of us are zealous enough at anything to have been who Saul was before he became a Christian. Well, if, if Christians are bad, we should do something about it. Hey, you know, we should do about it. Maybe we should arrest them. Hey, maybe we should go all over the country and do this, and we can be it. Like, hey, like if we're, if we're going to do it, we're going to do it. There might be a couple of really zealous people in here like that, but he's like, if we're going to do it, we're going to do it. In the same way, and so this guy with this unique personality goes from the number one persecutor of Christians to boop bop, the greatest missionary the world has ever known. In what I'm defining as two moments, but for him as one moment. Now we're going to give each other a, a brief pass here. And recognize, okay, well, that's not me. But you know what is you? God has called you to be on mission with him. That is the purpose of your life. Your purpose is mission. Now, I grew up in a church with a very traditional background, and if we use the word missionary, missionary meant something very, it was kind of this elite squad of people. And they would come and give reports at church. And they were weird, and they talked weird, and they dressed weird, and they did weird things, and they came back and were weird. And it's like, it was like God's elite weird force. And, and, and that's what missions was. And to be a missionary meant to you to be a part of the elite weird force. But then eventually we all have, and it's different now. Some of the people that are technically cross-cultural missionaries in other places are some of the best, most awesome, not weird people in the world. They just said yes to the thing that God called them to. But then there came a moment for me, and I hope there can come a moment for you where you recognize mission does not mean that I have to go eight time zones away. Missionary, mission, someone who has a mission means I recognize that the purpose of my life is to take the message of hope and life of God through Jesus Christ to the world. Yeah, there are going to be some people that the way that they implement that mission is going to be a little more exotic. It's going to require more risk. It, 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 it's, it's very different. But that is not the same as saying that being on mission for God is only for elite people. It is what God has called all of us to do. God has called you to take what he has given you and give it away. Because here's the thing that I've witnessed, and I have seen this again for 25, 30 years. I remember, I remember when um, the guy who mentored me in college said this to me that I was taking all this energy and I was using it to criticize my church. I was using it to criticize other Christians I knew that didn't get it. And I, and I had all this energy and it's like, I think what God's calling me to is to tell other Christians how, they're not, how they don't get it and they're not doing it right and they're not singing right and they don't do right. And I remember him saying to me, he's like, God has given you this mission and this energy, but he has called us to take this and to take it out there and if you fail to do that, what you'll become is just one more Christian who views it as his purpose to criticize other Christians. One church doesn't like this church. This church doesn't like this church. And, and people, I know you've been a part of church where there's just infighting. And, and, and we just do this and we, and, we, and we pick at each other. But God has not called us to do that. He's called us sure to encourage each other, to help us get better. But what God has called us to do is all together be his elite weird force. Every one of us to take the hope and message of life of Jesus Christ to a world that is broken and desperate for it. And for some people, again, that's going to be on the other side of the world. For some people, it's going to be for the, for, for, for the broken and the hurting. People who find themselves struggling with homelessness. People who are struggling with poverty or, or pain or some sort of persecution. People uh, helping, helping love and invest in our foster care kids. It may, you, know what, you know who needs a missionary? Your neighborhood needs a missionary. Your school needs a missionary. Your work needs a missionary. Everywhere needs one. And God is calling you to that. Those ki our kids and Grove kids need one. Our youth need one. There's lots of opportunities. But we've got to say yes first. We've got to have a moment where we say, God, 
whatever you say I'll do. And so what I would encourage you for both that lordship and missions moment, I would encourage you to invite God to have one of those moments with you right now. To pray and say, God, is there some area of my life in which I'm, I'm, I'm not submitting to your lordship? Is there something about my, the path that I'm on, the way that I'm living, that if you could change, you would? Now, I don't highly recommend that prayer. I, I, I'll take it, I'll say it a different way. I highly recommend that prayer. Just don't blame me for what happens next, is all I'm saying. Because God wants to, he wants to remake you for your good. And then say, God, if it's true, you are calling me to be on mission, where would you like me to start? Open yourself up today to those moments and just see. Just see what God would say. Because here's what God has called us to do and be as a church. To collectively together say yes to the fact that Jesus Christ is the Lord of us individually and collectively and that our lives individually and collectively are on mission with Him. So as always, we have time to, to, to pray and respond. So as you're, as you're worshiping, as you're, as you're praying, as op- obviously there's lots of opportunities in the back from the cross to communion to the prayer candles. Our prayer team is back there. We have an opportunity to give. Open up your heart and mind to a, a, a different way of living, a different approach to life, and, and, a, and a way to be on mission with God. And whatever He says to you, say yes. Let's pray. God, I thank you. I thank you for the people here who still need to make that decision to really follow you. That we are, God, we're just still stuck in our sin. We're still thinking that we're okay. Or we're thinking that we don't, that we don't have any hope. God, whatever's holding us back from saying yes to the life and forgiveness that your son offers us through his death on the cross. God, whatever holding us back, break it down so that we can say yes to your son, Jesus. And God, I thank you for those of us here who are still battling with the idea of lordship, whether because we are still excusing sin in our life or because we think we get to determine our own path. God, I pray that we would say yes to lordship. And God, I pray for those of us who are stuck, thinking our lives are about ourselves, our God, that we're just stuck with a critical heart. That God, that you would help us get unstuck and God, be on mission with you. And that God, that we would take your life to a world that is desperate for it. God, help us say yes to you today. And as always, we are thankful for your son, Jesus. And um, who makes all this possible. It's in his name that we pray. Amen.